What is up, guys? How we doing? Who, who had an eventful night last night? Anybody have an eventful night or morning, like mid, midnight? So uh, this little, uh, my name's Justin, by the way. I'm one of the pastors here. So glad that you're here. Uh, one o'clock a.m., our power goes out. And, uh, that, you know, just enough to wake you up and then kind of, you know, get you out of a, a rhythm. And we notice we, we sleep with fans. We're that, that couple. And so the fans go off. And, um, and so then we kind of fall back to sleep. The power comes back on around 2. And then the sirens go off, and the, the uh, tornado warning happens around 3.30. And so if I fall asleep during my message, you know why, all right? I'm, I'm going to give you guys grace if you fall asleep, but you guys are here this morning. That's extra credit in heaven after such an eventful night last night. I'm just assigning you extra points. And those of you that are watching online, half credit, all right? You guys get half credit. Uh, that's what I'm saying. All right. But uh, Hope City is a place where you can belong before you believe. And so if you're a guest, we're so glad that you're here today. Uh, hope that you feel welcome. Hope that you feel at home. Hey, before we dive into the message today in this new series, I want to let you know of uh, kind of a logistic uh, change that we've made to try to help you get more connected. Uh, we have a thing called the Next Steps Table, and it used to be out in the lobby. And, um, and so it kind of got congested out there as more people started coming back, back from the pandemic. And so we have moved Next Steps to right in the back of the auditorium. Uh, if you're online, you can't see that. Uh, but if you're here, Cheryl is back there right now, and we'd love to meet you. So if you're new or newer to Hope City, that's where you go to find about Intro to Hope City or Hope City Students. That's where you go to register for Rooted or get into a connection group. That is the next step for you if you're new to Hope City to find how you can get closer to God and uh, can get connected here at Hope City. And so our goal isn't attendance in 2022, it's connection. We want to help you take your next step spiritually. And so make sure you stop by the Next Steps table and uh, get the information that you might need to do that. Well, we are kicking off a new series today, and I'm excited about this series because we typically do series in four-week increments just because your attention span is so short. No, I'm just joking. Um, it just kind of works out that way. Well, this, this series is going to be six weeks, and it's going to lead us right into Easter Sunday. And we're calling it Let It Go, Releasing What Holds You Back. And I think it's going to kind of be a cool... Um, series because we're going to be able to talk about things that we need to release, things that we need to die to every single week over the next six weeks, and then we're going to experience Resurrection Sunday together. And I think it's going to be a powerful time to kind of put the exclamation point on, um, you know, what took place, you know, 2,000 years ago with the resurrection after we've gone through this series of what we need to, to let go of that's holding us back spiritually and relationally. So as we kick it off, I got a, a question that I have for you as we start. How many of you would say that at some, in some area of your life, you love control? You love to control, all right? If you're thinking about raising the hand of the person next to you, you're a control freak and this message is for you, all right? We all love control, right? At some level in our life, we, all of us at some level want to be in control. Some of you are control freaks at work. All right, you think in your mind, nobody can do it better. Nobody can do it as fast as me. Nobody can do it with the quality that I'll do it with. Nobody will do it in the same way that I do it. And so if you can't do it in the way that I want it done, then I'm just going to do it myself, right? And it's worked out for some of you, all right? But it's also cost some of you promotions or it's maybe cost you relationships at work or people don't like working with you or they don't like working for you because you're a control freak. Maybe you're a control freak at home. You have to have the lines in the carpet going in the exact same direction, right? When anybody else vacuums other than you vacuuming, it's not good enough because the lines are incongruent with one another, all right? You can't, you can't have that, especially if people are coming over, right? Because then it's a reflection on your abilities, right? Some of you are like, oh, the lines are in the vacuum, that's not that big of a deal. Who cares about lines in carpet? But you're psycho about lines in the yard, right? Like nobody can mow the yard like you, and you can't, you can't uh, you know, leave blades of grass uneven, and they have to be in a certain direction because the neighbors judge you, right, by looking at the lines in your yard, and you're just a control freak when it comes to mowing. Some of you fold clothes in a certain way, and the towels have to be folded in a certain way, or you lose your mind. Who put these towels in here? Who folded these towels, right? Now, now, I'm not saying anybody in our house is like that, um, but when uh, the summer before Trish and I got married, um, I was offered an internship at this church named, called Vermont Christian Church in Vermont, Illinois. And if you don't know where Vermont, Vermont, Illinois is, I don't even think Google does, right? It's a town of like 800 people. It's in central Illinois, but the church worked out housing for me for the summer, and they arranged for me to live with a 68-year-old widow named Millie Beans. 
That was her name, all right? Millie Beans. And Millie was eccentric, all right? She was, she, she was 68, but she acted like she was about 48. Um, her husband was pretty wealthy, and when he passed away, uh, she, had, she was pretty much independently wealthy. And so she traveled all the time. She was constantly going on trips. She went to China for like 14 days. She went, she went all over the world. But she loved having me there. She was pretty lonely, and uh, I was this college kid that needed some, you know, some company as well. And so I moved in, and she did, does like this get to know me like questionnaire. What's your favorite food? Uh, what's your favorite cereal? And she went out, she went grocery shopping and bought me all of these things that I love. Golden Grahams, favorite cereal. She stocked up on Golden Grahams. And, uh, and so she started just completely spoiling me. I was used to dorm food, and now Millie was making me, you know, homemade food every single night that I was there. It was amazing. One of the ways that she really spoiled me was how she did my laundry. Yes, she did my laundry. It was amazing, all right? I, I, was, I, you know, I, was, I was the oldest of four, so it was every man for himself, you know, as far as laundry goes growing up. And then I go to college, and you know, college you kind of do laundry, but sometimes you don't, right? You just hang the towel over the door. You don't really wash it. It's just, it'll be good for a couple weeks. And, and so um, Millie started doing my laundry, and she started washing, drying, ironing, pants, jeans, shirts, she would iron my t-shirts, people. It was unbelievable, all right? I never had my t-shirts ironed. And so I started buying like nicer t-shirts because she was ironing. I'm like, I'm going to go to Express, right? And not Target, right? And so I bought all these nice t-shirts. Well, when Trish and I got married, it was just a couple weeks into marriage, she wasn't doing laundry like Millie did laundry. And uh, my shirts didn't have that, that crispness. They didn't have that, that, uh, that ironing look. And so I don't know how I opened the conversation, but I will tell you it wasn't the right way uh, to open the conversation. And I said, hey, can we talk about my shirts? Because here's how you're folding my shirts. You're folding them like this, all right? And you do this and this and, and this. That's not how Millie did it, all right? And I, I said, Millie, she would take it and she would turn it upside down, right? And she would spread it out. She would take it like this and she'd fold this in, fold this in. Go right here, here, and then here, here. Boom. <laughs> Perfectly stacked in the drawer. No response. I was like, well, so maybe she's just taking it in. Can we talk about socks? Because here, here's, how, here's how you're doing my socks. Like you're taking my socks and you're matching them, but, which I appreciate. I'm trying to give some positive reinforcement. But you're going like this. That stretches out the band of the socks, all right? I don't need it stretched out. I don't want, like, you know, frumpy socks hanging off my legs. I said, Millie would take the socks, she would match them, but she would just fold them over. And that's, that's even more simple. Just put them in the drawer. Can I tell you guys, men specifically, 27 years of marriage wisdom coming right at you right now. You can have control or you can have intimacy, but you can't have both. And there was no intimacy for quite a while for this newlywed couple. All right, I'll just tell you that. I don't remember the choice words that were said, but I could not catch these socks and t-shirt thrown at me fast enough, all right? It was a traumatic experience that we're still in therapy for. All right, now, I wish I could tell you that was the only area of control that I demanded or that I want. The only time I've tried to control in my marriage or family, but I'm a massive control freak. I want to control the calendar. I want to control our, cal our travel. I want to control the money. I want to control the driving. I want to drive or be tranquilized while someone else drives, right? Now, when our oldest son, Micah, who spoke last week, uh, when he was learning to drive, um, I, was, I thought I could help because I feel like I'm the better driver, which is not true, but it's just a self, you know, uh, I guess a self-assessment that I've given myself that no one else in the family gives me, but I thought, well, I could help Micah, you know, this is a dad's role. Well, I may or may not have tried to take control of the wheel from the passenger side several times. And so after he got his driver's license, I've not, I've not been allowed to teach Isaiah or Elijah how to drive at all. All right. I've just been relegated to the back seat while Trisha actually teaches them to drive. Never had an accident, never had a ticket. All right. That's, that must have been something good. But I like to control things. I consistently try to control the remote control because not only do I want to watch what's on TV, I want to watch what might be on other channels of the TV, right? And so it's not about what's on, it's not about what I might be missing right now as I change the channel to find what's on. And so today I want to address what I think is a big issue for a lot of us, this issue of control. Because we can laugh at it at some level, and some of it is funny. 
But the reality is trying to control things that are not yours to control will damage relationships and it will hinder. It will place a cap, a lid on your ability to grow in your relationship with God. Here's why that's true. When we try to control things that aren't ours, aren't, aren't ours to control, it's a reflection of a lack of faith. Like if you're consistently trying to control things in your life that are only God's to control, what you're saying to God is, I know better than you. You know what, God? I can, I can do my finances better than you. God, I can do my marriage better than you. God, I can do dating better than you. God, I can do school better than you. I can do relationships better than you. God, I have this. I have this under control. And you're not necessarily outwardly, because that would be arrogant, but you're subconsciously and how you live your life. You're saying to God, I'm actually God. And I, I put this in your notes, that control is our attempt to be like God. Now, we don't think of it that way. We think we're being responsible. We think that we're, we're, we're being diligent in our life. We, we think that we're trying to live our life faithfully. But when you are constantly taking back control of things that are only God's to control, what you're saying to God is, you stay there, I got this. So you can have Sunday morning, God, but don't be messing with my life throughout the week. Don't be, don't be messing with how I am at work. Don't be messing with the person that I am at home. Don't be messing with how I am at school. I've got control of this. You stay in your place. And so what I want to do is I want to open up by looking at a verse in the Bible that is quoted all over the place. It's posted on social media probably every other second. It's so popular. But I want you to look at it. I want you to read it. I want you to, to absorb it this morning as if you've never heard it before. And you're going to recognize this as soon as we bring it up. It's Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. It says this. Trust in the Lord. This is Solomon talking, wisest man who ever lived. He says, trust in the Lord. In other words, surrender to God with all of your heart. Now, that word heart in Hebrew, it literally means gut. It means being. All right, it's not talking about an organ, it's talking about your spiritual, your emotional, your mental life, that, that all, everything that makes up the essence of you, to trust in the Lord with all that you have, everything you've got. And so let me ask you today, just as we get started, if you just want to do an honest assessment of where you are, how much of your heart are you trusting God with? Solomon says, trust in the Lord with all of your heart, with everything you have. And then he says something that is so difficult to do, it's easy to say, so hard to do. And lean not on your own understanding. Why is this so difficult? Because if you're a self-reliant person, you want to figure it out. Right? If you're a responsible person, you want to do it. Like you want to go your way. You want to, you, you want to um, have your decisions be the best decisions. He says, hey, lean not on your own understanding. And then he says, in all of your ways, submit to him. Now, this word submit, in Hebrew, it's a very interesting word because it actually can be translated acknowledge. And some of you are, as you're processing this verse, as you probably know it by heart, that might have been how you said it, in all your ways acknowledge him. And this, this word actually means, in, a, in Hebrew, it means a deep knowing. So he says, submit to the Lord, trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding. In all of your ways, know God. It's the same word, the same Hebrew word that is used in Genesis to describe Adam knowing Eve. This is the intimate knowing. And when you submit to God, when you trust God and you lean not on your own understanding and you get to know him, what's going to happen as a natural overflow of that? Your path is going to be straight. Right? Like we jump to the end. We jump to the, 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 the end and not look at the means. The means to the end is you submitting to God, you trusting God, you giving him all of your heart. And then allowing him to know you and for you to know him intimately so that your path will be straight. Now here's the problem. We read this and we say, yes, that's what I want. But then we try to take control. Why do we take control? I think that we take control because we're afraid of losing control. Which sounds very weird, right? But I think many of us live with this cycle that we... Try to control, right? We try to control our marriage, or we try to control our job, or we try to control friendships, we try to control our dating life, and we get a sense, man, this is out of my control. So that we get fearful of losing control. 
So then what do we do? We dig in. We try to control. And then what happens? We fear losing control. Right? And this isn't malicious. This isn't us saying, God, you know, forget you. God, I I don't love you. No, this is the human condition. If you look at Adam and Eve in, in the garden, they felt like God was holding out on them. So they took control of their situation. And that has been the pattern for all of us, generation after generation after generation. So, and some of us are exhausted because you've edged God out of an area of your life because you're trying to control it on your own. And this is the pattern of your life. This is what your marriage looks like. This is what your finances look like. This is what your job looks like. And you go from job to job to job every two to three years. Why? Because you get so tired. Maybe you jump from dating relationship to dating relationship to dating relationship. Why? Because the person that you're with gets tired of you trying to control them. Maybe you've burned through friendships because you're so, such a control freak. You're so afraid of somebody hurting you. You think, if I can control this person, then it's going to make me happier. And it's just this cycle, this perpetual cycle that we live our life in. And so I want to take a look at a passage today that... Um, It's in the Old Testament, and it's a great example of control gone wrong. All right, if you look at Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5 and 6, this is the opposite of that, all right? This is not, this is how not to live your life. When we take control of our life, we're not able to fully surrender our hearts to God. And so many of us, we say we want a fully surrendered relationship with Jesus, right? that's, That's the desire of our heart. That's what God calls us to. And yet, at the same time, we want to hold on to control. You can't live a partially surrendered life. It actually is the opposite of the actual word. When you surrender, you give up. It's not like you give up, but hang on. Surrender is laying everything down. So I want to look at a passage of Scripture that I think epitomizes how we relate to God. And it's Abraham and Sarah. And I think, just to give you some context, um, God changes the name of Abram and Sarai to Abraham and Sarah later in the Old Testament. But this passage is a great example of what I love about Scripture. If you, if you, if you struggle with cynicism or maybe skepticism when it comes to God's Word or, or even faith, I love this passage of Scripture because it reminds me that God could have sanitized and cleaned up the Bible. He could have left out all the messy parts. He could have left out all the authentic parts. He could have only given us the parts that are clean and that make him look good or make the heroes of our faith look good. But this passage of scripture is completely messed up. Micah last week talked about families who live in a, you know, a healthy rhythm of family. This is not that. But it's reassuring to know that a person that we look to as a hero of our faith made mistakes and God redeemed them. That God is a redeeming God. That God comes searching for us. That God can take the worst moments of you trying to take control of your life, and he can break the cycle of that control after you surrender it to him. And so Abraham is kind of this reflection of how I kind of relate to God. I think it's probably how you relate to God. God comes to Abraham and he says, hey, I've got a proposition for you. I want you to leave the land of your father. I want want you to leave the land that you know. And Abraham was super wealthy. He says, and I want you to go to a land that I'm going to show you. And Abraham said, well, do you have an address? Nope. Do you have uh, like a map, you know, direction? Can you give me some options on what route we're going to take? Nope. I will show you along the way. And you know what Abraham does? That's all the information he has. And he trusts God, right? Like it's like this huge win. Like he he surrenders everything. He's like, all right, family, let's pack it up. We're just, where are we going? I don't know. We're just going to follow this God that I've never had a conversation with before today. And we're just going to follow wherever he leads. And when he says stop, we're going to stop. You know what Abraham's family did? They went. That's a huge win, right? They're like, oh, that's surrender. And you know what happens after that? Fear. And so Abraham, in this area of his life, he was fully surrendered to God. But then there was another area of his life that he consistently struggled to surrender, and that was in his marriage. One time, Abraham and Sarah were interacting with this king, and they were nervous for their future. They were nervous that this king was going to either sex traffic Sarah, they were going to kidnap Sarah, they were going to kill Abraham. There's this fear that overcame them that if we don't get ourselves out of this situation, this could be dangerous. And so the king says, well, who is this that you're traveling with? Because I guess Sarah was very attractive, at least to Abraham. And he says, hey, this is my sister. 
And he lies, he takes control of the situation and lies about who Sarah is to try to escape the situation. They didn't, he didn't trust that God was big enough for the situation, even though God had led them there. You know what happens? A huge plague comes on this country as a result of Abraham's lie. And so there's this pattern. Abraham trusts God and he surrenders to God and then he takes control. Do you relate to that? Now, hopefully you don't relate to this story, okay? Because it's in Genesis chapter 16 and it's another example of Abraham taking control and Sarah taking control when God doesn't act in a way that they think he should. Verses 1 through 4 of Genesis chapter 16. Now Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children, but she had an Egyptian slave named Hagar. So here's the deal. God comes to Abraham and he says, hey, I'm going to make you the father of many nations. I'm going to make your descendants as great as the sand on the seashore. I know that you don't have kids yet. You're 75 years old. I know you're struggling to think about, you know, the future of your life, but here's the deal. I'm going to bless you more than any other man has ever been blessed. And your descendants will be blessed and generation after generation will be blessed. And I'm going to use you to create this new nation, this new covenant, this new promise. And you know what? I'm sure Abraham and Sarah, they went out and bought a bassinet and they painted the nursery, right? And they got the balloons, the blue and the, the pink, and they got the Instagram post ready to go because it's going to be gender reveal time. And you know what happens? Nothing for 10 years. So God speaks, it's, not, it's like they had this vision on their own. God speaks this truth, this speaks this future into their life. He says, hey, I know you don't have kids yet. I know you haven't been able to have kids, and it's been a real source of contention in our relationship, and it's probably been a real source of contention in your relationship, but I'm going to bless you. And then 10 years pass, and nothing. And so Sarah gets in her mind, you know what? I think God might have forgot about me. I think God might have forgot about us. Maybe God isn't going to keep his promise. And so she hatches a plan of how she's going to fulfill the promise of God on her own. She has this slave named Hagar. So she said to Abram, the Lord has kept me from having children. Go sleep with my slave. And then look at this next sentence. This is powerful. Perhaps I can build a family through her. Who has taken on the responsibility of fulfilling this promise? Sarah. Who's taken on the role of God in their life? Sarah. I mean, I know that you've never done that. I know that I've never done that. Man, she really did that, right? But we do that all the time, don't we? God doesn't show up in a way that we think he should or in a timing that, that we think is our timing. And so we take control. And she says, I can build a family through her. Abram agreed to what Sarah said. That's not an agreement that you want to make, fellas, all right? I'm just saying right now. So after Abram had been living in Canaan for 10 years, Sarai, his wife, took her Egyptian slave Hagar and gave her to her husband to be his wife. He slept with Hagar and she conceived. And then this, this last sentence is kind, of, it's kind of added on, but it really sets the tone from that moment in time to this moment in time. When she knew she was pregnant, she began to despise her mistress. Why is that relevant? God makes this promise, and God's timing wasn't consistent with their timing. And so Sarah took it upon herself to try to be God. Now, you may not know how this decision still impacts our world today, but here's what happens. Abraham and Hagar give birth to a son named Ishmael. Later on, as God was going to fulfill his promise, Abraham and Sarah give birth to a son named Isaac. If you look at the lineage of Ishmael, and Isaac, it's absolutely incredible. Out of Ishmael, you get the Palestinians and Muhammad. Out of Isaac, you get the Jewish nation and Jesus Christ. And here we are centuries later, and you have these two people groups consistently arguing, consistently fighting. There are wars and conflicts of war, or rumors of wars and conflicts that go on to this day because why? After she realized that her servant was pregnant, she despised her. And that, dis that despising, that, that hatred filtered down generation after generation. It was a wedge that still divides those two people groups to this day. So I want to take control. And I know it's not happening. It's not my timing. So I'm going to do what it takes to make it happen. I'm going to do it my way. Now, if you're single, you've probably struggled with this at some level. 
Maybe you've, maybe you've been in a place in your life where you're like, God, I just want to date who you want me to date. God, I just want to give you my dating life. God, I just want to give you my relationships. I want to be in a relationship with somebody who pulls me closer to you, not pushes me further away from you, God. God, God I, I want to be patient. I want to wait for the right person that you have. Right? And that's been an authentic, sincere prayer of your heart. You've offered that to God. You've surrendered that to God. And then what's happened? Nothing. Right? All that's happened is you've been in wedding after wedding after wedding of all your college best friends. All that's happened is you've watched people that you're close to that you know are way less attractive than you, both physically and emotionally, get married. How can they find someone? How can this? She's whack. How can she find someone that loves her? And I can't find somebody that loves me. Right? And so what have you done? Now you're just dating anybody that has a pulse. If you're with that person, don't look, make eye contact with them right, right now, okay? But now you just, you've settled, right? You've backed down your standards, and now you just want somebody, anybody, to love you in a way that makes you feel valuable. You've taken control of your dating life, and you're not with somebody, or you haven't consistently been with somebody who has pushed you closer to God. You've actually fallen further away from God because of the people that you chose to be with relationally and in a romantic relationship. Maybe for some of you, you're helicopter parents. You want to take control. You're, you're struggling because you know that your kids are exceptional. And nobody else's kids are as exceptional as your kids. And you want to make everybody, make sure everybody knows that your kids are amazing. And so you control your kids' clothes and you control their friends and you control their music. And if you're in Hamilton County, you probably control their school projects because their school project is going to crush every other kid's mom's school project. It's what you do. Because how your kids interact is a reflection on you. Who they are, how perfect they are, is a reflection on how perfect you are. Right? And so you take control. You don't intend to be a helicopter parent or grandparent, because your kids aren't raising your grandkids like you think they should. But that's just, that's just what you do, right? Maybe for some of you, this is true in your finances. Like you, you're in this place financially where you're really struggling, and you know in your heart, because you've grown up in church, or you've been in church, or you're in a relationship with God, you know that God calls you to be generous. You know that God calls you to give back a portion of what you make, whatever that is. If that's $10 or $10,000 or $100,000, you know that God calls you to do that. But you know what you say to yourself? I can't afford that. I'm in such a bad financial position, I just can't afford to be generous. I can't afford to be obedient. I can manage my money better than God can. And so when I make more money, God, then I'll be obedient to you. Then I'll surrender to you. That's not how it works, is it? It's not as we have more that we surrender more. We have to surrender where we are in order to have what God has for us. I, I really struggled with generosity. And I really struggled with parenting the first eight years of Micah's life because I felt like his performance was a reflection on me and so I want him to dress right and act right and be polite because I'm a pastor and he needs to reflect that I'm a pastor and it almost cost us our relationship I had to change how I parented I read this stat this week from the Huffington Post that said in 2019 eight percent of 2019 college graduates took one parent to a job interview what what? Now, some of you are like, what's the problem with that? You're a helicopter parent, all right? If you're thinking that, what's the problem with that? that that's, that's not right, right? I mean, that's just, that's crazy. I, I want you to think, of, now here's what I want you to do. It's easy to judge the 8%. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to think about what area of your life are you trying to control right now? What area of your life is this describing you? Is this your marriage? Is this your finances? Is this your career? Is this your dating life? What, what area is that? Now, in front of you, there's a piece of paper that looks like this. I want you to grab that piece of paper. I had a counselor tell me one time that um, the best thing that we can do with our wounds is give them a name. And so that's what we're going to do with this. We're going to take this and we're going to give it a name. We're going to write it down. I want you to write down what you struggle to control. All right? Now, my wife wants me to write down nine things. I'm just going to write down one, okay? So just, just one thing, all right? The one thing. Now, you might, you might struggle with, like I do, with more, but I'm just going to write down the biggest thing that I struggle to control, okay? And we're going to do something with like that in just a few minutes. Here's what I want to do as we, as we close. I want to give you some application. There's an aspect of our faith where we're responsible for, okay? So I'm not, I'm not advocating us shirking responsibility. But we also have to have discernment 
Like, how do you know what to surrender and what to control? I want to give you three questions that you can ask yourself and go through this process to know, okay, do I need to to control that? Is that mine to control? Or do I need to surrender that to God? Okay, so the first question is this. What is driving my need to control? What is driving my need to control? Most of the time, the control that we demonstrate in our life is not about control. It's a response to an emotion that we're feeling. Right? It's like a gateway drug. Control is like this. Really, it's, it's a symptom of much deeper issues that are under the surface. Control oftentimes can be a response, a response to fear. We fear, we fear that our kids are going to fail or get hurt or not uh, love us or have their heart broken. And so out of that fear, we respond, right? And we become overprotective. We make them wear a helmet when they go to get the mail. Like we, we um, you know, try to control the, the friends that they have or who they date. It's not because we want them to hate us. We're fearful that they won't love us. Maybe for some of us, it's in our marriage. We have this fear that our spouse isn't going to love us the way that we want to be loved or need to be loved. And so we try to control them, not because we want to push them away, but because we're fearful of being hurt. And it's that fear that drives us. And so we think, if I can just control them enough, then they will meet my expectations. Maybe for you, it's financial. You fear that you're not going to have enough money to retire, enough money for vacation, or enough money to feel comfortable. And so you make people in your house feel miserable when they go to Target and spend $20, when they go grocery shopping. We make people feel miserable about the money that they spend, not because we don't like them, but because we're fearful. Sometimes we control out of insecurity. Our kids' performance in sports reflects our value. Our kids' grades reflect our intelligence. Our kids' social calendar reflects our popularity. So we're insecure, and we find our identity in how great our kids are, the success of our kids. Maybe for you this plays out at work. You're, you're so insecure about getting your boss's approval that you try to control everybody in your office. And so you have people that, that really like you, but they just don't like working with you, or they don't like working for you. And you're, you're constantly trying to earn the accolades of other people because you're trying to fill that void of insecurity in your heart and you're controlling and manipulating and trying to, to walk over people to get that promotion or to, to make sure you get noticed, to make sure everybody knows how important you are. We, we can feel insecure in our finances about the tax bracket that we're in or the house that we live in or the car that we drive or the vacations that we can go on or the possessions that we have or don't have. And, and so we, feel, we look at money and we think that's going to make me feel important. That's going to make me feel accomplished. That's going to make me feel successful. And so we work 80 hours a week trying to fill that void of insecurity in our life, and we separate ourselves from the people that we love the most and that love us the most, trying to build a better life for them, well, we don't really have a life at all. So what is driving you? What is driving you to control? You have to answer that question first. Second question is this. Is this, whatever you wrote down, is this mine to control? M-I-N-E. Is this mine to control? This, this isn't, surrender isn't a mandate that you just throw your hands up and go, well, God's got it all, right? It's all going to burn anyway, right? I had a family member who used to say that. I would get all stressed out about a test. Well, it's all going to burn in the end anyway. I'm like, okay, that doesn't help me in this moment, all right? I, I, we'll talk about Armageddon later. I need some help with this test, right? Like, so this, this isn't, you know, just throw your hands up and like, oh, God's in control. I don't have to control anything. I put this in your notes. Surrender is not your responsibility, this isn't a get-out-of-jail-free card for you just to be irresponsible with your life. Well, God's got it. If you're in a bad place financially, God doesn't want you to say, well, the Lord will provide for all my needs. Is that true? Yes, but you have a role to play. If you're in a mountain of debt right now, you know what you need to do? Something about it. Sign up for Financial Peace University. Make a budget. Stop, start spending less than you're spending right now. Bring in more income compared to how many expenses you have going out. Like There are things that you can do to be faithful while God is responsible. If your marriage is in trouble, God doesn't want you to say, well, you know what? We've been working on it for quite a while. I can't change my spouse anyway, so this is as good as it's going to be. No, you can examine your own heart. You, you can ask your spouse to go to counseling. You can make time for your spouse to go on a date. You can turn off the TV. You can have hard conversations. Like you can do something about it. You can do things to improve your marriage regardless of how your spouse responds. If you allow God to change your heart, your marriage is naturally going to be better, even if your spouse does nothing. 
If your kids are making bad decisions and they're a bad spot academically or socially or spiritually, you don't need to surrender your responsibility. You need to be present relationally. They don't need a warden. They, they need a listener. They need somebody that's going to be able to offer grace. There's going to be, they need somebody that's going to be available. One of the areas I had to grow in as a dad was trying to control my kids athletically. I wanted to control their love for basketball because I love basketball. And so I wanted to do film sessions after second and third grade basketball games. I thought that was reasonable. All right. There's some mistakes that were made. Although we didn't even keep score, I knew the score. All right. And I want to talk about the score and I want to talk about the 27% shooting. Right. And let's, let's go over form. Let's, let's, let's talk about this. And I began to drive my son. I wanted to drive his workouts. I wanted to drive his training. I wanted to drive, you know, his performance. And it began to create a wedge in our relationship. And so I recognized that at like fifth grade, we were constantly at each other's throats. And I, Trisha had to make a rule that I could not talk about the game on the way home from the game. I knew I was in trouble. And so I quit coaching because my relationship with my son was more important than his performance. And you have to be willing to identify those things. Is it mine to control? The last question is this. Is this for God alone? Is whatever you wrote down, is this for God alone? This past year... God has been growing me uh, in my surrender of control of Hope City. Some of you are like, well, you control Hope City? I'm not supposed to, okay? No, I, I'm not supposed to. That's the illusion of control. I thought I did, right? And so when you think you control something that you're not in control of, it will exhaust you. And I held a high standard of, you know, I'm, I'm still responsible. I'm held to a high standard of accountability for Hope City, but I'm not in control. And so I've been trying to control so much. I've been trying to control the quality of the online pres- uh, experience because I want you to tune in online. I've been trying to control our in-person attendance because I want you to come back. And I've been trying to control Hope City Kids because I want you to trust that your, your kids are going to be safe in Hope City Kids. And I, I want to control if you're staying or going to another church and what church are you going to and are they a part of Hope City anymore? And I want to control who's staying and who's going and what, what do they think about me and what's their perception of Hope City? I want you to control all of that. And can I just tell you, that is an exhausting way to live. The church isn't mine to control. This is God's alone. And that's what I wrote down. Hope City. It's my one thing. Many of you know that we've had a facility need for the last two years, actually. But our lease ended in December, and so we don't have a crisis yet, but we we have a need. The way I'm describing it to people is we're walking toward the Red Sea. All right, we're on our way. All right, we've left Egypt. And we're not to the Red Sea yet, but we're going to get there in June. Okay, and we need to have a facility. And so I've looked at 14 different facilities over the last 12 months, and none of them really have worked. And so you know what I've thought? God, I've got, to, I've got to figure this out. I've got to make this happen. And so we, you know, found different facilities that, you know, are bad locations, but they're, you know, inexpensive. We found places that are great locations, but they're expensive. And it's been a daily reminder that I need to surrender. And so in January, I went around to all of our connection groups, like nine or ten connection groups, and I had the conversation with them that I've given up operational control of Hope City. I don't manage the staff. I don't control the operations of the church. Trisha does all of that. She is in charge of all operations, all ministries. She's, she meets with the staff and manages the staff. And you know what's happened since January, look around. Growth. Right? Some of you have come back for the first time since January. Some of you have been here for the first time since January, ever. You know what's happened since January? People have joined connection groups. You know what's happened since January? People have gotten invited, involved in Financial Peace University. They're finding financial freedom. You know what's happened since January? We're sensing a sense of momentum. I had, a, I had breakfast with the Hope Church pastor who we rent this building from. They meet in the gym. I know maybe some of you have been confused when you walk in, like, what church is this? Hope Church, no relation to us, meets in the gym. We meet in here. Had breakfast with the Hope, Hope Church pastor. He's like, man, you guys got a ton of momentum right now. And I was so, working so hard to try to create momentum, I forgot that it's God that breathes momentum. Pastors don't create that. We're just a part of it. And so I've been able to be reminded that, you know, as we look for property, we, um, we've looked at two places that are potential fits. 
So we look at another place for the second time tomorrow. And so I'm asking you guys just to pray. Pray that God shows up. We, we don't need something that I can provide. We don't need something that I come through with. We need a God thing. And we need to know that God has ordained this and blessed it and anointed it. And he's going to prepare a way for us. Philippians chapter 4 verse 6 says, Don't be anxious about anything, but in everything, in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. But when you overestimate your ability to control, you underestimate the power of God. And that's a sentence that I'm writing for me as much as you. You know what I've sensed God saying to me the last three months? Justin, do you not think I love Hope City more than you? Do you not think I love my church more than you love it? And maybe that's what God is saying to you today. Do you not think that I love your marriage more than you do? Do you not think I'm fighting for your marriage more than you? Do you not think that I want you to be with someone in your life that loves you and values you and moves you closer to me? Do you not think I, I have a person in mind for you? Do you think that I care less about that area of your life than you do? Do you think that I care less about your finances than you do? Do you think I, I, I clothe the lilies of the field? I take care of the sparrows. I take care of their, their most basic needs. Do you not think I can take care of you? Do you not think I care about your kids more than you do? Before you even knew their name, I knew them in the dark of the womb. I've had a relationship with your kids longer than you. Not me, I'm speaking on behalf of God. Right? God, God knows you. He loves you. He has a passion way greater than anything that you can have a passion for. And in order to experience God's best in those areas, we have to surrender. Here's the problem. Surrender isn't a one-time event. It's a daily choice. Matthew 16, 25 says, if you try to hang on to your life, you're going to lose it. You try to hang on to this, you're going to lose the best parts of your life. But if you lose your life, for me, you're going to find it. So here's how we're going to respond. The band's going to come out, they're going to lead us in a closing song. And we're going to do something physical with these. I want you to take these, and I want you just to, to wad them up. And we're going to, as a physical act of worship and surrender, we're just going to come up during this song, and we're just going to toss them into these Waste baskets on the stage. I was nervous I wasn't going to make that, all right? <laughs> Control. Um, but we're going to toss them here as an act of surrender, as just this physical reminder God, I'm laying it down. And here's the deal you may have to lay it down again on Wednesday, and you may have to lay it down again next Saturday, and you may have to lay it down again. And you, you, spouses, you don't need to remind them what they need to lay down, all right? This is between them and God. But as you come up today, I just want you to, to whisper this prayer to God. This isn't mine to control. I'm surrendering this to you. Okay, so let's stand together. Becca's going to lead us, and then we're going to come during this song and surrender.